Hello everyone, welcome as you join us for Bible study. Uh, we're continuing our series of Revelation, the book of Revelation uh, in the New Testament. And today it's the turn of chapter 10. If you have a Bible or access to scripture, feel free to open at chapter 10 uh, of Revelation. And the title really for today's chapter is The Angel with the Little Scroll. Uh, we'll read the text first uh, from verses 1 to 11 chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He held a little scroll open in his hand. Setting his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, he gave a great shout, like a lion roaring. And when he shouted, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and the land raised his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives for ever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it. There will be no more delay, but in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled, as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel, who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat. It will be bitter to your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. So I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Then they said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And may God bless his word to us today. I don't know if you've ever thought about uh, loud noises or you've probably been in the presence of many loud noises in your life. But the loudest noise ever recorded from an individual human being uh, is quite a question, and it's something that actually has made the Guinness Book of World Records. And it's from a lady, a lady who has hit a certain number of decibels uh, in her voice pattern, and she reached 121 decibels. Now, if you're not sure how loud that is, it is equivalent to the sound of a jet engine. It's unbelievable. Do you believe that sort of sound could come out of a human being. Obviously she was shouting, but that's the level of the noise that came from a single human being and has made the Guinness Book of World Records at 121 decibels. I suppose the first half really of chapter 10 is all about noise. There's a lot of noise in here. But mind you, uh, the previous chapters in Revelation have been quite noisy as well. But this continues here in chapter 10, this sense of noise and loudness and shouting. And we're going to look at that now as we go through the verses together. At the beginning of chapter 10, John sees another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face is like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. So this is another angel. There has been tons of angels uh, so far in the book of Revelation. I've been doing different things. I've been present in God's throne room in heaven. And now this is another angel. It seems to be uh, differentiated from the others, or he seems to be differentiated from the others. And he's called a mighty angel. Now, some people translate this as it, it must be Gabriel or Michael, the two, one of the two archangels in the Bible, the two that are mentioned in Scripture, as is a hierarchical feel about this angel. He's a mighty angel, differentiating him from other angels uh, present in heaven. So some believe this could be Gabriel or Michael. 
Some believe it is Jesus himself. Because of this sense of being uh, wrapped in a cloud, uh, which is probably uh, a white fluffy cloud, uh, most likely, uh, a rainbow over his head, his face like the sun, the shining, which we've seen Jesus already being like that in the book of Revelation, and his legs like pillars of fire, symbolic of judgment. But there's something in the verse that gives it away that it can't be Jesus. That it is another heavenly being, another uh, angel given uh, a certain job to do. Because I want you to look at the word another in verse 1. If it's another mighty angel, then there have to be others like this angel. There are others uh, similar to this being. Therefore, it cannot be Jesus who is unique and is only one off and being God himself. So it is another heavenly being. And the word another, if you look at the original Greek scripture here for the word uh, another, it's coming from the derivation of being created. An angel is a created being, therefore it cannot be Jesus. So there's further evidence that this angel cannot be Christ. Jesus is not created. He has always been. He has always been. He's always been part of the Godhead. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, three in one, one and three. So this being is created by the Greek uh, translation of the word another. We see a sense of this being being created by God himself. Therefore, uh, at least it is either Michael or Gabriel or another angel sent to do this job. And so he's coming down from heaven. He's wrapped in a cloud. So it's a very heavenly look about him. A rainbow over his head. Now, let's go back to the very beginning of Genesis. And, of course, we've seen the rainbow coming uh, after the flood uh, subsided uh, with Noah and the ark. And that was the sign of a covenant between God and humanity that he never would flood the earth again. So this rainbow over the head of this angel is a symbolism of God's covenant still with his people. He still wants to reach out to his people, in, even in these late days of the earth and what is going to happen to it and its history. The future of the world is coming towards an end by the time revelation unfolds. So the covenant is still with the people. In other words, God is still reaching out in promise to his people, even in the middle of all this judgment and darkness uh, that has been written about. His face is like the sun. He's obviously reflecting uh, the glory of heaven. And his legs like pillars of fire, symbolism of that judgment. He's carrying God's judgment here. And in the scroll, we're going to see further judgments unfold uh, as we look at the scripture. So verse 2, we see that this angel has a little scroll open in his hand. He sets his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now, in some ways, if you take that literally, he must be huge, a huge angel, one leg on the land, one leg in the sea. But it's symbolism again. It's picture language that the earth is the whole thing, is it's sea and land together, and God has control of the whole of his creation, the whole of the earth. That's the symbolism of the right foot uh, on the sea and his left foot on the land. Is control of creation. But what about this little scroll? What is the little scroll? Open. There's no seals on this scroll. You remember the original scroll earlier in Revelation, which only Jesus could open. Only Jesus could open the seals. Only God himself could do that. This scroll has to be different because this angel is holding the scroll and it's already open. And John is going to hold it too later on in the chapter. Therefore, it cannot be the, the larger scroll that we've seen earlier in Revelation because we haven't seen what was written in that fully. I believe this little scroll is a condensed form of the wider, bigger scroll that we've seen uh, earlier in Revelation. This is almost like a condensed form of God's will that only human eyes are allowed to see and other beings in heaven 
because the main scroll, no one is able to see that in its completion bar Jesus himself. Because the will of God for the whole of, the, of eternity is contained within it. And it's too much for us to take on board as human beings. And even the heavenly beings aren't allowed to see it either. But this little scroll is a condensed form of that. We're allowed to see a certain amount of God's will. Because we are finite beings. We are subservient to God. We are not to be elevated to the stage where we can see the whole of God's will at any time. But the little scroll gives us an insight to God's will. And the Bible and all of scripture, we see God's will working through that. But God's will is even bigger than that. It's even bigger than what we can actually see or read. So this little scroll is open in the angel's hand. And he gives a great shout in verse 3, like a lion roaring. Here's the sound, the noise thing coming in. A great shout. This angel, uh, remember, he's a majestic being, he's mighty, and he's great power coming from his voice. A great shout. Everyone will hear it, like a lion roaring. And when he shouts, the seven thunders sound. So we're moving on to something else here. Seven thunders, what are they? It's not seven types of thunder or seven occasions of thunder. It's actually seven individual blasts of sound. And it's believed these are further judgments. We're not told exactly what they are, but they're coming from the angel. They're coming from the little scroll. The seven thunders, once the scroll has been opened, these seven thunders come forward. Now, before we go any further, I want to draw you into the Old Testament for a moment. Do feel free to join with me in this particular psalm. Psalm 29, if we go back uh, into the Old Testament to that particular piece of scripture, you will see something quite amazing in correlation to these seven thunders a way back in the Old Testament. It's Psalm 29. And in here, in Psalm 29, we see the words, the voice of the Lord. In other words, the voice of the Lord is speaking uh, towards the earth and to the people. And the voice of the Lord is something that is thunderous in this occasion, in Psalm 29. It is something that is very strong, something that's powerful. The voice of the Lord can also speak in gentleness and quietness too. But in Psalm 29, I want you to just look at the words, what the voice of the Lord is doing when it goes forward, the sheer power it has. And there's seven times the voice of the Lord is mentioned in Psalm 29. The voice of the Lord is over the waters in verse 3. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. Verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Then again, the voice of the Lord breaks cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. In verse 7, the voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. And the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. And finally, in verse 9, the voice of the Lord causes oaks to whirl and strips forest bare. Those are all powerful pictures of what God's voice can do. And they're thunderous things. And many believe there is a connection between the seven voices of the Lord in Psalm 29 to the seven thunders here in Revelation 10. They're not specifically ironed out here in Revelation 10. But you can see what the power of God can do and his voice and when he speaks. Remember when the angel shouts, he is shouting forward the voice of God into heaven and to the world. Verse 4. When the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. You can see John there in anticipation, listening to the seven thunders and about to get his pen or his quill, whatever he's using, and writing down what he hears. But he is stopped in his tracks. He hears a voice from heaven saying, we believe this is the voice of God himself. Seal up what the seven thunders have said. In other words, go no further. 
I do not want you to record that and do not write it down. There's something important about this that God does not want what is said in the seven thunders to go forward at this time. John uniquely has heard them. No other human being has. It's not written in scripture, therefore we don't know what the seven thunders had said. John excitedly was about to write it down what he heard, but the voice from heaven tells him, do you seal those up and don't write them down? Again, there's something in here that we should not know the full will of God. It's back to the little scroll again, the condensed form of the main scroll. The seven thunders, we're not to know what they are at this stage either. We're not to know the full will of God. And this is a challenge for mankind, for humankind not to know everything. There are human beings who continue to, to want to know the secret of everything, uh, the meaning of life, uh, how we're here, how the universe operates, all of those things. And it's wonderful to gain knowledge, absolutely. But man, woman, will never, ever know everything. And the Bible is clear on that. And you can see that coming through here again, even at this stage in Revelation. Daniel 12, verse 9. Daniel's a fascinating book, if you ever get a chance to read it. We may know the stories of Daniel uh, going with his friends uh, to Babylon as slaves, and he wouldn't take part in anything there. He prayed to the Lord, remember, openly, and uh, he was he was through into jail and eventually into the lion's den uh, at a later stage in his life. And we know all those stories about Daniel, different things that he did. He stood fast with the Lord regardless of the, uh, the enemy that he was enslaved with. And of course, uh, Daniel in the fire as well, and how he survived that. We may know those stories, but actually half of the book of Daniel is apocalyptic. It's a fascinating and unique book in the Old Testament. It's the only book that records uh, a sense of, of the apocalyptic that is in a par with Revelation at the end of the New Testament. And there are areas in the second half of Daniel's book. It's part of Daniel's vision. It correlates with parts of Revelation. If you get a chance, do read it. It can give you deeper insights to Revelation. And remember, Daniel lived some four or five hundred years before Jesus was even born. And so Daniel 12 and 9 tells us too, that these things will be sealed up and are not to be written down. Interesting, the correlation here uh, with verse 4 in Revelation 10. Then the angel, this is this angel with the scroll again, who stands in the sea and the land, raises his right hand to heaven. He's taking an oath. Raising your right hand is symbolism of taking an oath, taking a promise. And he swears by him who lives forever and ever, God himself who creates heaven, what is in it, the earth, what is in it, and the sea, what is in it. In other words, the whole of creation. This angel is taking an oath before God. And what he is saying is true and trustworthy and straight from God anyway himself. And he continues on there in, in verse 6 and verse 7. There will be no more delay, he says, but in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet. Now remember, this chapter is an interim period between the sixth trumpet, we looked at last week, and being blown, and the seventh trumpet coming, which is even more uh, judgmental for the world. So this angel is saying, in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled. As he announced to his servants, the prophets. Mystery, an interesting word. Sometimes uh, in the Christian faith, uh, there are things that, that we may read about in the Bible. Uh, and we may say to ourselves, I don't fully understand that, but I fully trust in it. And we may say, it's a mystery. Who can fathom uh, the will of God? That is true. And sometimes in our human finiteness, we say it's a mystery to try and describe it. 
Well, a mystery is not something that is hidden for all time. Sometimes we understand mystery as something that we'll, uh, we'll never see. A mystery can be revealed. And it will be. The full will of God will be known at the end of time. But not now. You see, a mystery will be revealed. The thing that makes it a mystery is that we mightn't fully understand the revelation. A mystery can be revealed, not hidden forever, but the understanding of it, what it actually is, is maybe difficult. So the mystery of God will be fulfilled. And when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, that will unravel that and will continue to reveal God's will. As he announced to his servants, the prophets, the prophets of old, the Old Testament prophets, remember they brought the word of God to the people, to the world at that time. And a lot of it was spoken into that time, but also it had futuristic uh, undertones to it. Perhaps even the prophets themselves never, never fully understood the mystery of God, even though that he was revealing that to them. Because again, they were human men used mightily by God, but maybe not fully understanding what they were actually being told to say either. So the mystery of God is something that is revealed, but perhaps not fully understood until God's will is finally uh, fulfilled. So this angel has a very important role here uh, in what he's speaking, what he is shouting actually. These words are heard all over the place. This uh, symbolism again of noise. And so he, he announces it uh, to, to everyone. And on to verse 8, the voice is back again that he'd heard from heaven that John had already heard God's voice speaking, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. This is the same angel again. So John goes to the angel and tells him to give him the little scroll. John has got a unique thing to do here. He's got a unique mission. He's told by God himself to go and take the scroll out of the angel's hand. You see, if John went to the angel direct, the angel would know to hold that back from him because God maybe hadn't ordained it yet. The angel will act in God's will. But because the voice from heaven has spoken directly to John, the angel will also know that and will relinquish the scroll to John. Remember, the angel is acting under God's will, and he must do. So the scroll then is open in the hand of the angel, standing on the sea and the land, so John goes, and he gets the little scroll into his hand. And the angel says to John, take it and eat it. Can you imagine eating a scroll? <laughs> In literal terms, it wouldn't be the tastiest thing in the world to eat a rolled up parchment or, or paper. But remember again, it's picture language, folks. Picture language when the angel is telling him to eat it. Because the little scroll contains the word of God. The will of God and therefore also the word of God is within the little scroll. And when John eats it symbolically, it's bitter to his stomach, with sweet as honey in his mouth. So what's going on there? First of all, when you eat something, it has to go into the mouth first. The first passage is the mouth. And it's honey, it's sweet. And the word of God is always sweet because of its truth, because of its eternal nature, because of the welfare that we have if we trust in God's word. The beauty of salvation, eternal life, God's promises come to fruition, his sense of never leaving us, and all the thousands of things you can think about God's nature that become within us. If we trust in God's word, it's always sweet. Even though it's challenging, it can be difficult. And in this time of tribulation and revelation, it's still sweet because it's God's truth. It's God's revelation. So God's word going into our mouth should be sweet. 
but then it gets bitter in the stomach. Why? If it's sweet going in, why is it turned bitter? Well, this is not for John as an individual. The bitterness of the stomach is the sense of what happens to God's word in the world. See, John is being gifted with the gift of prophecy here. And we'll see that in a moment or two when we finish off the last verse. And he's going to have to go forward and bring God's word, the sweet word of God to the world. But it's the reaction in the world that makes the outcome, the consequences of that bitter. Because it's for two reasons. One of them is that those who still don't receive the word of God for themselves, the truth of who Christ is into their lives, then they will be left embittered, spiritually speaking. If the word of God has not become real to them, they don't know the sweetness of it, the beauty of his message, and the, the salvationist message that it brings. They will only be left with an embitterment of a lostness in eternity and a damnation. So the word of God, as beautiful as it is, also has a sting in its tail of judgment for those who don't receive it. Therefore, a bitterness will set in. Also, it reminds us of the tears of God for those who are not saved yet. The bitterness of tears. Those still not receiving his son, Jesus. So the word of God is always sweet. But if we don't receive it for ourselves, bitterness will take over. Spiritually speaking, in the sense of a lost eternity. So John, verse 10, John takes a little scroll from the hand of the angel and he eats it. You see, the other thing about this is too, folks. The word of God is not forced into anybody. John willingly takes it and eats it. Yes, the angel tells him what to do, but he can still refuse. He's still in the sense of free will. But he does take it and eat it willingly. And he eats it. It is sweet to him in his mouth. And when he'd eaten it, his stomach becomes bitter. As the two reasons we looked at earlier. You may remember uh, further back in the Bible that this similar thing happened to another prophet. If you wonder or know where it is, Ezekiel. Ezekiel ate a scroll in his prophecy. It was sweet in his mouth and was bitter inside for similar reasons to what's happening to John here. So there is again that correlation uh, between Old and New Testament in regards to this particular thing. But John is receiving the gift of prophecy here. When the word of God goes in, it has to come out again. And they say to him in verse 11, who are the they? It's the voice from heaven and the angel in unity. God himself and this mighty angel. You must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And that's lovely. At the end of Revelation 10, we see all the darkness and the judgment still coming through and the noise and all of that. But God still hasn't given up on his people. Even though still to receive him or or haven't come into the kingdom yet, he's given them another chance through John here to prophesy to everyone, peoples, nations, languages, and kings, those in authority in the world, right down to the most lowliest of people. Prophesy to them. Bring the little scroll, the sweetness of the word of God, into the world. And we hope and pray that they do not become bitter. That more and more people will come to faith and won't get the bitterness of judgment. That is promised for those who still refuse Christ. Thanks for being with us today, folks. Um, we will continue with chapter 11 in the new year. Uh, the Bible study uh, will uh, be stopping uh, at this occasion. We're moving into the season of Advent. And we will have Advent services in St Andrew's Parish Hall here at Middletown. You're very welcome to come and join us uh, for those for the weeks ahead. And we will rejoin ourselves in January again. 
do look out for that uh, as we continue to look uh, at Revelation and the really the second half of the vision. So let's pray together uh, before we finish. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word today. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you for the challenge of it. We thank you, Lord, that uh, your word is sweet. Regardless of what is happening in your word, it is sweet, it is truthful. It is uh, the, the way to eternal life, the way to salvation through Jesus because of the cross. Lord, help us to receive it, to receive you into our lives as our saviour. And Lord, not to reap the bitterness of your word, which tells us that there's judgment for those who will not come to you. So Lord, be with us now and until we meet again. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you safe. Amen.